Okay, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Brian Sloan. I'm the current chair of the Cambridge Socio Legal Group. I'm very sorry for the delayed start to this event. It's due to some logistical issues within the law faculty, but I hope that we'll still have plenty of time for a very interesting presentation and also some questions afterwards. So, uh, Valentin, you're going to speak for about uh, 15 minutes, you say. And at the end of that, we'll have time for questions. I think the easiest way to cope with questions is if you just enter them into the box, the Q&A box on Zoom. But without any further ado, um, I'm going to hand over to Valentin. Thank you very much for joining us. And I'm very fascinated to what you, about what you have to say about the biography of the reasonable person. So thank you very much. Yes, thank you, Brian, uh, for for having me and for um, for the introduction. I, I am also sorry for the postponement of the seminar. It uh, clashed with the birth of my first child, which came unexpectedly early. So I actually had to write to Brian in the middle of the night from the hospital to say, I cannot make it. So thank you very much. Uh, Brian and to the group that the rescheduling was possible and uh, for all of you to uh, show up now for the postponed session. Uh, as we only have um, 45 minutes since I'm determined to stick in the interest of the rule of law and predictability to the two o'clock ending if at all possible, I'll uh, try to keep things reasonably short today and um, to do just two things. One, to give you a brief overview of um, the Reasonable Person's Biography, the book project that is uh, the basis um, of the talk in general terms. Uh, so that is one aim. And the second one is to just present the one core argument of uh, the book and maybe of the biography. And then if there's anything else that you want to explore, uh, we can do so, of course, uh, subsequently. Um, and if there are questions as we as we go along, because sometimes there are questions that uh, merit addressing immediately, because they prevent um, any subsequent understanding, you can also write them in the chat. I am by now a seasoned Zoom instructor, so I, I keep an eye down here uh, on, and on the chat as well if there's something that you want to address right away, but otherwise there's of course time at the end. All right. The, First part, the overview. Um, the story of the reasonable person for me personally began, well, in some sense, as an undergrad law student, of course, um, but more uh, properly in 2012 when I was sitting for the uh, Old, Souls, uh, Old Souls Prize Fellowship exam. And there was one question on that exam, uh, which was um, Who is the most overrated figure in your field? And um, I wanted to answer that question. I thought it's an intriguing question. It's a tricky, daring question. And of course, all kinds of characters came to mind. Um, and I was looking at the uh, the wall of the Old Souls um, dining hall where you have all of these big portraits of presumably very important people. And I was reminded when I did so of a portrait I had spotted a few days earlier in Keys, where I did my PhD at the time. Um, of a man who I thought uh, could be linked um, to this question. And that portrait, I will try and see if I can show you this. I hope you see it. Um, if not, give me a thumbs down or complain in the chat. I cannot see complaints. So hopefully you can see this portrait, uh, which um, as this picture confirms, hangs, as you can see here with Pippa in keys. I checked it out to confirm my memory in October last year. Uh, so this is the portrait of a judge, um, not just any judge, it is Judge Edward Hall Alderson. And Judge Edward Hall Alderson was the judge, as some of you might know in the case from 1856 Blythe and Birmingham Waterworks, which is one of the first cases uh, to mention explicitly the reasonable man, the reasonable person standard. And by that bridge, I thought hmm, maybe the reasonable person is a safe choice to write about as an overrated figure in the field. Uh, at that time, I think I had uh, the, the concept or the figure for me had maybe more negative than positive connotations. And I channeled the frustration of 
my undergraduate years with the reasonable person standard into that essay. Needless to say, I didn't get the fellowship, but the question remained with me of this reasonable person, who it is, what the point of it is um, as a native continental European, as a German, I was not intuitively familiar when I came to the UK to study law with this concept. So I had always wondered a little bit about who this figure really is and which function it serves and whether there's a difference between asking whether something is reasonable uh, or whether something is um, an action that a reasonable person would have engaged in. I didn't return to that question for a while. I had planned to write my postdoc about it and then didn't. And then I ended up in Sweden. And then after a few years, I revisited the project. And as I researched um, the reasonable person, it's life, it's many manifestations a bit more, I grew fond of it, um, actually quite fond of it, as you uh, might um, realize in the course of the talk. And I decided to present the findings of my study in uh, the form of a biography or in a form that resembles at least a biography. So that has a kind of um, birth and life and maybe end or afterlife. Um, and I did this in the um, following way. Maybe you can see this first page. This is the, the draft manuscript. Um, if anyone wants the draft manuscript and you are careful with it, I'm, I, you can email me and I can, I can share it if you like. So this is um, the structure of the project. I'm beginning in ancient times, ancient Egypt, ancient Greece and ancient Rome, the reasonable person in the past. Um, here I'm showing the, the ancient predecessors or ancestors maybe rather of, of this concept. And the point of that is just to show that this particular common law reasonable person concept that we have at the moment and that we are so familiar with is only one example of many different similar creatures, not same creatures, but similar legal creatures that uh, have existed at uh, many different times and in many different places throughout time. Uh, the second chapter discusses the reasonable person in Birmingham, and that's really the story of the birth of the common law's reasonable person concept in England. Uh, Birmingham, uh, Woodcock Street is where the water pipe burst that then triggered Blythe and Birmingham Waterworks, the case. So here I discuss uh, the impact that industrialization processes and the sentimental enlightenment thinking of um, Scottish thinkers like Adam Smith and David Hume had on the emergence of the particular English um, or common law version of the reasonable person, reasonable man at that time. We then go to Clapham. Uh, this is the mid late uh, 19th century. And here I address uh, the life, uh, the first few 50 years of the standard in England and the reasons for our association or the judges association of the reasonable person with the man on the Clapham omnibus. So I'm problematizing Clapham, why Clapham, why an omnibus, why a man and so on. I then follow the standard into the colonial courts, mostly into Nyasaland, Malawi nowadays, uh, just because Malawi has an um, extremely well-kept record of those uh, early colonial court cases and how the standard was applied by those English colonial courts on the African continent and, and elsewhere, but mostly in Africa. Uh, then I trace the reasonable person to the battlefield and into international law where this man, Sir Maxwell David Fife, a prosecutor at Nuremberg, but also um, a Lord Chancellor of England, he, he um, introduced the reasonable person standard also into international law. So I discuss how that works in international law and then um, I, look at the reasonable person in the future and how technology, digitalization, big data and so on impact how the standard is applied or might be applied in the future. And then there's a concluding chapter, which is really the only or maybe the most analytical chapter where everything I said before is drawn together and neatly packaged into um, a manual of how to apply the standard in ideal terms. And I will come to that in a moment. But that's just by way of overview so you have an, a rough idea of how this project looked like looks like 
as you can sense maybe from that overview, it is a, it's a meta perspective that I'm taking. I'm not zooming in on specific fields of private or public law or international law. Um, I'm trying to capture what all of these different creatures, and they are, as I said, they're definitely different. I'm not saying the reasonable person was born in ancient Egypt and it is the same character today, but there's a core to all of these um, different characters and that's what I try to work out. And that brings me to the main argument um, of the book of the project, the, the, the core rationale of, of this empathetic character. And the core rationale I think is that the reasonable person device is a particular example of an empathetic perspective taking mechanism. And that means um, two things with respect to the perspective taking part. It means that the key feature of the reasonable person standard is not the reasonable part or the ordinary part or the average part or the rational part, the attribute. The, the attribute is not what's important. What's important is that it is a person. Who, whatever attribute one chooses, the reasonable person, the excellent person, the ideal person, the average person. Um, what's important about this particular standard and which sets it apart from general reasonableness standards or general standards for assessing behavior is that it is about a person. That one doesn't ask, did X behave reasonably, but that one asks, did X behave as a reasonable person would have behaved? Um, that is significant that it is a person, I think, because it means that it forces the judge, and by judge I mean not necessarily just judges uh, strict to sense or just uh, the judge in the rope in the courtroom, but anyone who invokes the standard when assessing a situation, could be a lawyer, could be a law student, could be, could be a judge, um, could be any kind of legal subject, that it forces whoever invokes the standard, to take the perspective of another, because it forces the perspective or the, the view, the glance to another person. You said, ask, what would a reasonable person do? It doesn't ask, what would it be reasonable? You can, of course, answer the question, would it be reasonable, or was it reasonable what Valentin did in a particular situation? You can answer that question by taking a perspective, but you don't have to take a perspective. You could also be of the view that what is reasonable or not, or what is right or not, or wrong or not, is objectively uh, determinable by uh, deducing it rationally from, from a codex or from principles that are generally applicable. By asking, would a reasonable person do something, you have to take that step out of yourself. Um, so that's the first e significance, I think, of arguing that the reasonable person is an empathetic perspective taking device. The second aspect with, res with respect to the empathy part um, means that the perspective of the other that we take um, is taken by empathetic means or so as empathy based. So it's not a process where we rationally construct or conclude or speculate on a view that it would be reasonable to have uh, on behalf of someone else, but that one uses um, the central faculties of, of us, of our mind, of our soul, to feel in, um, to sympathize with, how it would originally have been phrased by Adam Smith and David Hume, to sympathize with, to empathize with the view of that other. So it is about the view of another and it's about identifying by um, means of emotion, of sensing in, of imagination, uh, what that perspective of the other would be. And um, how that would work in practice or how it would ideally work if one wanted to apply this in ideal terms, uh, I will now spend the last four and a half, five minutes maybe on explaining. So I think um, using the reasonable person as an empathetic perspective taking device could consist of three steps. Um, the first one is that when passing a judgment, and again, as I said, it doesn't need to be a judge, it could be anyone who, who passes a judgment or makes an assessment. Uh, when passing a such 
judgment, the first thing one has to do is to intend to take the perspective of another, to position oneself vis-a-vis -vis the perspective of another. And that means, um, as Adam Smith would have said, one of the Scottish sentimentalists I referred to earlier, it means to divide oneself into two, at least two, uh, perspectives of people, the agent, the one doing the assessment, and the spectator, the one that is the other, that is the reasonable person or the impartial spectator, as Smith would have described that perspective. And this is important, just the state of mind to position yourself vis-a-vis -vis another perspective, because it entails acknowledging that you're well, first of all, that other perspectives exist. Uh, there are other plausible views um, on a given matter. It also, yeah, the flip side of that means um, that also you acknowledge not just that there are other perspectives, but that your own perspective is in fact a perspective. It's not an embodied truth. So it is also um, a process that makes your own view defeasible in a way um, that I think is helpful. And it creates um, a self distance also between you yourself doing the assessment and the perspective you hold. So um, in other words, we are not, by thinking about perspective taking in this way, we aren't the view we hold. We hold a view, but we are not the view. So our identity is detached from our perspective. And I think that's important when it comes to um, arguments about different perspectives, because being aware that one's view is not one's identity makes it easier, I think, or should make it easier to be open to criticism because it's less threatening if one just discusses views that are not our identity as such. In the colonial context in particular, th this distinction often didn't work out at all. So that's one reason why I think it's important to consider. As I mentioned at the beginning, we can unpack all of this. But in the interest of time, the second step, first step, positioning oneself vis-a-vis another perspective, essentially acknowledging that we have, we have a point of view, law is not perspectiveless. The second step is to actually take the perspective of the reasonable person. And this is a bit tricky maybe, um, complicated, uh, many things can go wrong here at the second step. The way I imagine it is that the reasonable person's perspective that one attempts to take by means of empathy that that perspective is located within a triangle of other perspectives. There's a perspective of the defendant or of the person or of the action that is being judged. Um, there's the perspective of the judge of ourselves, our own views on the matter. And then there's um, also society or the general context within which the judgment is being passed. If the perspective of the reasonable person gets too close to either of these three perspectives, one has a problem. If it's too close to the defendant, law becomes subjective. If it's too close to the judge, it's uh, just a biased application of law. And if it's too close to the society, it risks being oppressive or authoritarian. So one needs to stay in the middle of, of that uh, triangle. Um, and how one ascertains that view is very context dependent, um, of course, and it's difficult to um, capture in concrete terms. But the way I imagine it is that one should, rather than trying to identify the location or the identity of the reasonable person, rather than focusing on the person, um, one should engage in a process that's almost like walking backwards towards the position that the reasonable person is deemed to occupy. So rather than seeing the reasonable person, the point is to see what the reasonable person would see, rather than feeling the reasonable person or speculating on whether they're male or female or all of these things are relevant, of course, but rather than fixating on that, one should concentrate on what it is that the reasonable person actually itself sees. So it, it's less the, the person, but maybe the glasses for which one looks uh, at a case that is important. So one positions oneself vis-a-vis -vis another perspective, one takes that other perspective, the one of the reasonable person, and then crucially at the third stage, one reassumes one's own perspective uh, and position and passes judgment. And that's very important because it means that any judgment based on the reasonable person is a judgment calibrated by things other than what the reasonable person itself might um, see or feel. Um, because the, it's not the case that the perspective of the reasonable person itself 
dictates or stipulates um, the outcome of a case. In moral philosophy, it's a little bit different. In theology, it's also a little bit different. But in, in law, we have precedent to relate to, we have legal norms to relate to, we have a legal context to relate to. So um, the, the view and the perspective of the reasonable person is always calibrated um, by taking those external factors into account within the legal framework that one operates. And that's why that third point is important. And the, the other aspect of this third point is that the reasonable person never speaks for itself. The only records or information we have about the reasonable person or that I, as one of the biographers of the reasonable person could access, are things other people have written about the reasonable person or speculated. Um, about the reasonable person. And I think that is, uh, to some extent, that's frustrating, of course, if one wants to tell a neat story because many of these uh, records are contradictory. Many of the cases make completely contradictory claims about who the reasonable person is, but it's also um, a circumstance that protects uh, the standard from acquiring two authoritarian um, dimensions because no one can claim to speak exhaustively, exclusively on behalf of the reasonable person. There's always a possibility of other takes, other interpretations, other views of that standard because it is shielded by that um, wall of interpretation or that, that interface of the judges who apply it. So um, in conclusion, I think the reasonable person as a, an empathetic perspective taking device can be a very valuable tool or aid for, for passing judgments because it reminds ideally those who pass judgment that theirs is only one perspective, that there are many others perspe other perspectives and that in order to acquire a holistic understanding or an understanding that transcends one's own understanding of a given act of a given situation, one has to step out of oneself and one has to um, yeah, look beyond one's own horizon. And as a result, I would hope uh, that if the standard is understood in this way, and I think it should be understood in this way and often has been understood in this way, uh, even if only implicitly, that it introduces a healthy level of humility or degree of humility to judging, which ultimately leads to fairer, to better, more accurate um, judgments. Now, it is absolutely the case um, that the reasonable person standard uh, has been criticized, um, can be criticized, should be criticized uh, for, for all kinds of reasons. Um, and I'm not shying away from those criticisms, uh, neither now nor in the biography. Uh, many biographies, if not every biography is, is broken in some way or has its uh, dark patches and the reasonable person is no exception. But I think many of the points of criticisms that are conventionally leveled, leveled against uh, the reasonable person standard are criticisms that are more accurately directed to the legal process in general that it is biased or that it can be biased, that it can um, be problematic uh, that male notions of law of justice have dominated um, for the largest parts of history, the legal process, um, that it can be discriminatory. All of those are concerns that are generally true uh, for the legal process as a whole. And I think the one benefit of the reasonable person compared to systems that have general reasonableness standards is that the reasonable person makes it absolutely apparent when such um, problems occur. The fact that the reasonable person was for the longest part of history known as the reasonable man communicates very transparently that it was really the reasonable man whose behavior counted and really no one else's behavior. Uh, the fact that in the colonial courts, the judges explicitly said when assessing self-defense, for instance, what counts is whether a man on the streets of London would have deemed the behavior of Jackson, son of Frank in Malawi reasonable. Uh, the fact that they phrased it like this makes it absolutely apparent how absurd it is to compare the behavior of uh, Jackson, son of Frank in Malawi in that situation to the behavior of a man on the streets of England. So I think um, that's where I will leave it. And um, I look forward to your comments, questions, concerns, 
points of criticism. Thanks for your attention. Well, thank you very much. That was an absolutely fascinating tour through your research, very succinctly presented. And hopefully people will be able to enter some questions or maybe even some comments into the Q&A box. While people are gathering their thoughts, I wonder if I could abuse my position as the chairperson and ask one question. I see we have a question already, but I will carry on. I suppose my question would be, well, is it too easy for a decision maker to assert that they are in fact stepping out of themselves and adopting another's perspective? But in fact, another person could come along and say, well, you're not doing that at all. Mm. As you hinted at, you're, you think you're stepping out of your own mindset, but you've still got the concerns, the prejudices of people who come from your particular background. And I suppose my question would be, how can we measure whether this perspective that you advocate has in fact been adopted? <laughs> yes, it's a good question. I mean, it's a it's a tricky test, and I've thought quite some time about designing a test um, where one would empirically check if people make different assessments depending on whether they are asked to assess whether a given act was reasonable or not, or whether a given act was an act that a reasonable person would have engaged in. Uh, I haven't done that test yet, but maybe maybe one could do that. In any case, the test is of course not foolproof or it's not a guarantee that the perspective taking will be successful. Um, and there's also th this process is complicated by the fact that, as I discuss, especially in the military chapter of international law, the yeah, perspective taking is complicated by the fact that the more powerful people are, and judges are of course very powerful people, uh, the, the less accurate uh, their perspective taking becomes and the less likely they are at um, using empathy to engage with the people who's, um, who are affected by their decisions. So um, I would say it's not foolproof. And the only way to safeguard against the abuse of the standard is to hammer home the point that it is about empathetic perspective taking. And even if it fails uh, and people assert to do it, I would say it's still better than not asserting it at all. So we have to compare with systems like the German negligence standards. Uh, where you would just assess general reasonableness. And there you, it's very intransparent to understand what really is going on. Okay, so we have some questions from audience members coming in. Uh, you'll be able to see them yourself, but I'll read them out anyway. So Helen Scott, thanks for the paper and says that a question that's bothered her for a while is does the reasonable person suffer from cognitive bias, biases, for example, with regard to the assessment of probability? Yes, um, I, I would, pro I mean, it can. <laughs> I would probably say that the reasonable person itself doesn't do much. Um, it is, uh, but it is of course possible that um, those who employ or invoke the standard um, suffer from certain shortcomings or biases, definitely. And those cannot be, the reasonable person standard itself is not a way to overcome them. I think at best, it is a, an invitation to do the best one can to check once or check against cognitive biases. Um, but we are limited by, by, the, by the terms of our own perspective and our own existence in a way. There are some ways one can enhance this. Um, the, the more experience people have with different types of people in different types of situation, the, the more likely they are to get an accurate um, sense of what others uh, feel or think. Um, but ultimately, the test is not a guarantee, um, absolute. But I think if accurately understood, there's a higher likelihood that a reasonable person standard is less likely to suffer from cognitive bias than a non-personified reasonableness standard. I think that would be my answer. Okay, great. So 
we've got Eleni asking with regard to your second step, mm -hmm. taking the perspective of the reasonable person, why should we stay in the middle of the triangle? i.e. the triangle of dependent perspective, judge's perspective, society's perspective, rather than adopt, for example, an objective perspective mm. as to how a reasonable person would act. Yes. Um, this is a normative argument, I guess, that I'm making, or it's part normative, part empirical, maybe. The, the conviction that I have is that this objective a truth of an objective point of view does not exist. It can only exist as an approximation or in terms of an approximation of the view that a collective holds about um, the truth or the, an objective standard. So each person, maybe I'm not, I don't think maybe one has to go as far as saying there's absolutely no objective truth. But what I would say is we all hold maybe one puzzle piece or one mosaic of that whole. Um, and to claim direct access, as for example, some thinkers of the rational enlightenment would, would claim that the late Kant, for example, would say, um, not the early one, but the later one, you, you can deduce truth or, or what's right and wrong directly by employing your faculties of reason. To say that is um, risking to be quite um, authoritarian in some way or, or could, could be discriminatory against other points of view. And I think that's why I grew so fond of the reasonable person because the reasonable person is whatever um, view you have. It's always a reminder that there's another way of doing things. There's another point of view that one can and should consider. So that's why I would say that objective point of view doesn't exist or not. it's not accessible for just one individual human being. Okay, great. Uh, we now have a question from James Mannering, who says that your analysis to his ear focuses on the reasonable person, the fact that the standard is anthropomorphized. The same could be true of other standards, the good person, the fair person, the wise person. I read you, he says, as defending that anthropomorphizing standard in general rather than defending reasonableness specifically? And he's asking, is that a correct analysis of your view? Yes, that's absolutely correct. That's why I think compared to much of the scholarship on the reasonable person in the past, it focuses on what is reasonable. Um, I focus on the person part. I think the scholarship about reasonableness is e extremely important. My wife specializes in exactly those a question. So I, I have nothing against that kind of uh, scholarship, but I think the point about the reasonable person is about the person, about the anthropomorphization. Also because it communicates a, a humanity or it, it makes it human, the standard. It is not a perfect standard. It is a person uh, that is doing this. And this in part also goes to the previous question about this objectivity. It's about what a person would do. It's not about what God would do or what uh, natural truth would command us to do. It's what a person would do, not maybe an average one, but um, another human being, even if it's a fictional human being. Okay, that's great. We have a question in a sense along the same lines as to what I asked earlier from Christopher Hose. He says he'd be keen to hear more from you about how one practically distinguishes their own views as a judge from the reasonable perspective? Can judges really be capable of being more empathetic through the reasonable perspective if they're already consciously trying to do this from the internal perspective, assuming mm. optimistically that they are in fact trying to? Yeah, well, I hope they can do it. <laughs> I would stipulate they have to be able to do it because that's ultimately what I think making judgments is about. Um, and that's what the job of a judge is. Um, and some scholars I discuss in the book also argue for specifically that reason, a judge ideally needs to be embedded in the community in which they work and live uh, and judge 
um, in exactly for, yeah, in order to get the exposure uh, required to take the perspective of another. But there's no question um, that the English colonial judge, to use an extreme example in Malawi, probably has absolutely no idea about the reality and the, the senses and the emotions of Jackson, son of Frank. Um, and that probably means that the judge is out of place, that that judge is um, not in uh, the right place to make those judgments. So whenever a judge feels, and this is a very similar problems in international law, which I normally work in, if you have judges sitting in the Hague uh, or arbitration panels that make assessments of um, situations on the ground thousands of kilometers away with no knowledge of the local circumstances, it's exactly the same. It's probably not in an ideal setting for making judgments. So I would stipulate judges have to be able to do this. And if they feel they are not able to do it, then uh, they are probably in the wrong place. Um, but in any case, one, one can communicate to judges that this is really what it is about. When I studied law in Oxford, we didn't really problematize the reasonable person standard. And I kind of just equated it with reasonableness um, and didn't think much about it being a person. But if one would teach people and say, this is really about stepping out of yourself and taking a view that is not your own view, maybe that could help um, getting closer to that idea. But it's an idea that is very difficult to achieve, absolutely, because we are caught in ourselves, I think, um, ultimately, of course. Okay, the questions seem to have stopped. I think we've had a really very interesting discussion. So thank you again, Valentin, for your fascinating presentation. Thanks to you all for coming. And uh, do you have any particular publication plans that you want to share at the moment? Or Well, still? yes. I, I have a publication plan. The publication plan is to publish the book with CUP. CUP has had the manuscript for almost nine months now without any feedback. Uh, so if you come across any of uh, the CUP editors in Cambridge, uh, do <laughs> encourage them to have a look at this manuscript. But that's the plan. The book is ready. As I said, if anyone wants to read the manuscript, um, I'm happy to share it. It's not meant to be widely circulated, but of course, if you want to learn more about Jackson, Son of Frank or Woodcock Street in Birmingham, I went to it also. Uh, there's sadly no house remaining except one old pub from the 1850s. And then just let me know, I can put my email address here in the chat. It's also otherwise easily accessible online. And then I send it over. So thanks a lot uh, for, for having me. So I think that uh, chat message has gone just to ah. host and panelists. Uh, I'm not sure how easy it is to get a chat message to everyone, but certainly if you... Yeah. Otherwise, but, I mean, you can Google Valentin Yorgi yes. and there's only one. And, uh, yeah. Find it. Oh, yeah, so uh, my colleague has just sent it to everyone. Ah, Daniel. Uh, I think perhaps we better cut the name of the particular publisher out of the recording just in case. <laughs> but uh, I'm sure we're all familiar with some of the uh, difficult politics uh, surrounding uh, publication and the fact that people who are reviewing manuscripts are quite often having to write manuscripts <laughs> themselves. So, yes, yeah, so any reviewers in the audience, I am. Um... No offense caused, I hope. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, uh, thank you very much to everyone. The next seminar from the Socio Legal Group will be on the 14th of March when Sarah Lockwood will talk on the theme of protest. So if you're interested in that, do keep an eye out for announcements circulating around Cambridge and or subscribe for a mailing list. But with that, I think we'll uh, bring proceedings to a close. Thank you very much again for your fascinating presentation and I hope to see you all again soon. Take care.